I'm here with William Buick, two-time champion jockey. So William, we're going to start very simply at the start. So whereabouts are you from? I grew up in Norway, um, just outside Oslo. And uh, um, that, that was my home until I moved here at, when I was 16, 17. Your, your dad was a jockey? Yeah, dad was a jockey. He, he's, uh, he, started, he actually started his career here in Newmarket. Um, and uh, eventually ended up in Norway and had a, had a very successful career riding in, in a lot of places ar around the world. And um, obviously uh, he was, I did watch him ride when I grew up and uh, you know, he was, he was, you know, obviously I would say probably my first inspiration to, to want to become a jockey. Yeah, I was going to say, when did you start riding then? It was, I guess it's a, just a family thing then. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I was on a pony before I could remember. So um, I've seen pictures and stuff like that. So horses and ponies have always um, been, been in my life from the, from the very, very start really. And was it always your kind of dream as a as a kid to be a jockey, or was it just you're doing it for fun, or what was the kind of? Yeah, it it was, it was, and it was. Um, but obviously, I grew up in Norway, so it wasn't sort of as mainstream over there as maybe it would be in England or Ireland. Um, so I remember, like from I think I was sort of eleven, twelve, thirteen years old. I I sort of diverted a little bit I didn't I don't I think I must have had it a year maybe more where I didn't ride at all um, and I just pursued other things um, like did a lot of snowboarding and and uh, obviously in Norway being a you know a country with cold winters a lot of skiing and stuff like that so um, and uh, so th that was sort of a bit of a point in my life where I, it, it wasn't it wasn't what I was really pursuing and then was there no kind of obvious pathway when you're a kid yeah thinking that, like that, that, oh, i want to be a jockey or i could be a jockey where's the pathway from being a kid yeah, in Nor norway yeah. to? Uh, I, mean, I mean dad at this stage dad um lived in england so he he was uh, very much involved um in in racing and uh, obviously mum lived in norway the, where, where i lived so it wasn't until i used to come visit dad in the school holidays um me and my brothers and and then I think I sort of went racing with dad. He, 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 was, um, he was working um, for the press association and doing the close-ups at the races. So we used to always go racing with him. And I think seeing, you know, racing over here gave me a bit of an eye opener. Open and I thought, eyes, you know, yeah. yeah, and it was, um, you know, it, it was, uh, that was really what got the ball rolling, I, I guess, you know. And what, like, because you mentioned snowboarding and, I guess, football and things that I would associate more with Norwegian, like, sport. What, what like, your kids kids growing up with, what, what did they think of you kind of riding? I doubt many other people rode horses, Yeah, right? it, it, it was, like, it was not, no one, no one in my school at any stage of my schooling did the same. Um, Christian, who, who is, who is, uh, who I've been, you know, good mates with since since I grew up. Um, he was the only one who who would who would come to the stable with me and would share a bit of in, bit of an interest. But he he only he only really sort of tagged along, if you like. Uh, um, and so there wasn't any mainstream in, interest at all. Do, do you um, think that's what kind of turned your eye when I don't know how old you'd have been, where you're just seeing all the other kids are doing other things, and it's not like a, I don't know. Yeah, it's. It, it was. It's looked upon as a, you know, it's a, it's a hobby. That's what it looked upon as. And, you know, I remember when I, when I was close to, to making the move, to come to England. You know, that was crazy. What they thought. You know, how could I, try and be a jockey? You know, it's, it's just not. It, it there's no, there's no real. There's no one that's done it before, really. No, no one's done it before, really, and and it's. It's sort of a, in Norway, where, where certainly where I grew up, you you know you, you get your education, you go to university, and if you're good at sport, you pursue whatever sport that may be. But 
you certainly didn't do what I did. You left school and moved to another country to pursue a career that um, no one really knew much about. Forgive my ignorance, but like in Norway, in Norway, is it very like very much a structured way? The kids come through, do these. Is it very much like that in the culture, or is it yeah, just no different to anywhere no, else? No, it is, and society is very. Um, you know, it, it's a great country. It's it's uh, very resourceful, and you know, it's it's very safe. Every every um, you know, certainly where I grew up, it was a it it was a it was a great upbringing, and um, you know, great childhood, uh, early teens great friends and uh, you know we had we had everything we could wish for and so the move over to England how did that come about so obviously um, dad was already living in, in England um, he moved to England when I was I think about 12 so um, and sort of from then onwards I guess I, I, I used to go to um, Every school holiday, I would, I would try and go visit him, like me and my brothers. And actually, my first, my first summer job in, in racing was at Reg Hollinshead's in Rugeley. Um, and Andrew and Sarah obviously were there as well. Andrew took over not so long after. Um, and how old, and are you, how old are you at this point? I think I was 14. Okay. 13, 14, I think. And you uh, kind of set thinking, oh, I want to be a jockey now. Yeah, that yeah. was... That was but it was hard work and it was definitely an eye opener for me, you know, it was, uh, I'd never really sort of been um, on my own as such. And, you know, I, I, uh, I was very well looked after, but I sort of had to fend for myself a little bit. And I was, you know, I told them I could ride where I, co I could ride, but some of the horses I was riding were definitely too much for me. So <laughs> I got run away with a lot. I fell off a lot, but, you know, it was all part of the learning curve and, I never, it was never any stage that I think it wasn't for me, you know, I always wanted to get up and do it again and uh, that was, that was my, my, my sort of first, first job. Do you remember that kind of age outside of, like, maybe outside of kind of the racing side of things, but do you remember kind of being like daunted culturally, because it's, it's a different culture, this country, isn't yeah. it? Do you remember yeah. that? Can you remember any specific yeah. moments or can you? I mean, obviously after, after that, you know, it was I, I, every, every, um, Every uh, holiday, I, I just wanted to go go back to England. And my dad spoke to Martin Dwyer and asked him, you know, where 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 should I send William? He said, send him to Andrew Balding in Kingscliff. And I started off. I think the first holiday I had there must have been two weeks or something. And that was that was the beginning, really, of of uh, of the sort of the path to where I got to and I remember when I went there you know it was you living in the hostel you with the other lads and it was a, it was a again it was a great place great people and a, a great way to learn and to grow up um, you learned the proper way um, you mentioned growing up is that not about being kind of independent doing stuff oh, yourself yeah. all you, of that stuff yeah it? you you grow up pretty quickly and especially obviously like you like you said you know I was foreign you know I could speak English speak very well understood everything but like the, the whole sense of humor and sort of the banter and, you know, the piss taking and stuff like that. Yeah, most of it just went completely over my head. <laughs> and then, and then like, you know, some, sometimes like the, some of the Irish lads, I couldn't understand what they were saying. And then, can you it, still, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it was just, and I look back and it's funny, you know, it's, it's, it was great times, great times. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm very privileged to, to have at that time. This leads me on perfectly, and if you're watching this, this is a very bizarre segue, but this leads me perfectly onto the corner of the Cobb story at Andrew oh, Boldings, yeah. which are now yeah. going to tell perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, there was always plenty of banter going on, and in the hostel there was, a, you know, there was three or four, four of us sort of similar age, um, all wanted to be jockeys, you know, um, and we were all pretty, we, we were all, Pretty good, pretty decent, and I, I, this is way before I started race riding. I uh, hadn't, they hadn't even had my um, my apprentice course yet. I was due to come up to go and have my um, my course in Doncaster at the uh, uh, racing school in Doncaster. So how upcoming is this? Very I like a few days or something? A couple of weeks, maybe. Of weeks. It's pretty close anyway. So you're thinking about it a lot. So yeah, so. 
this Sunday morning, we're just messing around looking for stuff to do. I'm sure we were all working the weekend anyway. And uh, I can't remember exactly how the corn and the cob ended up where it did, but we were in the kitchen area. So in the, in the dining hall in the hostel and we started kicking around this frozen corn on the cob. And, you know, I was, I, I think anyway, I was always very quiet, you know, never got into trouble. And, and the, the other lads, they were a bit more, they were ahead of me and, you know, they, they were a bit more mature and, you know, they were a bit more they, mature kicking it, around. If the there was anyone going to get into trouble, it was, it was, it was rather, it was probably more likely to be them than me. <laughs> but anyway, so I kicked, the corner of the cob and it goes straight through the biggest window in the in the in the hostel in the front window and just this massive smash and I thought and it was from my foot obviously I kicked it and everyone just looked in like complete shock and I just I couldn't believe it I, I thought it was like a bad dream I was quite timid at the time anyway and just you know like you say, like the whole banter thing and stuff like that. Anyway, I absolutely, you know. You thought this is it, it's over, back I, to Norway. It's finished, it's done, yeah. I might as well go back to Norway, begin to start school again, and this is me done. So I was wrecking my head, you know, what am I going to do? What am I gonna do? So I went back up to my room. I thought, well, I need, I need to go and tell Andrew and the governor, Ian. So it's Sunday, I'm hoping they're home. Anyway, I'll try. So I got my best shirt out at the time, give it an iron, put it on, <laughs> put some shoes on, went over, knocked on the door and I'm quivering, like I'm, this is like the worst moment of my life. And Andrew answers the door, answers the door and Ian is directly behind him. And I'm sure, I'm sure like I was nearly crying and, you know, apologizing profusely for kicking the frozen corner of the cob through the window in the hostel. And I don't, I, I'm not sure, I can't quite remember their response, but it wasn't, um, I think they were shocked. They couldn't quite believe what I was coming out with, <laughs> like how worried I was about it anyway. But look, it was, a, it's a funny story anyway. And it's, it, you know, to this day, um, it's, uh, it's something I can laugh about now anyway. <laughs> but kind of looking back on that, you say kind of, that, I guess that aside, you say it's a great place to kind of earn your stripes and learn, yeah. you know, how to behave and how to be well, a jockey. Yeah, you, you learn respect. And, and I remember my, my first morning there, when I, when I actually left school and started full time, um, Ian, the governor, um, he, he, he would take me, take me off and I would, I'd follow him. I, I wouldn't, I'd be with the string, but I would follow him up the gallops and uh, and he, he he would just tell you just follow me and you know you'd, you'd follow him on a horse called Tiny Tim who actually had my first ride on ride uh, ride on he um he had a hog mane um and he was he was a, the governor's polo pony really but he couldn't really do that job so he just became the apprentice horse um and you would just follow him everywhere over jumps over baby hurdles, everything. And obviously Tiny Tim didn't like jumping, so he'd whip round. But you know, you, you'd have to just get on with it. Um, and then eventually um, I joined the main string and you know, I think as far as an, an, a, an apprenticeship goes and, and a, a young jockey wanting to learn, um, I don't think I could have had any better eyes um looking at me and, and trying to nurture me and, and help me and and were you able to kind of pick their brains i mean what two brains to be able to kind of pick to learn right yeah and he was always you know he, he the governor he, he's always he's always looking at, you know you should always sit properly whether you're walking down the avenue after exercise or whether you're cantering or whether you're riding work or pushing a horse in in, in the mornings everything has to be done neatly and properly um and he, he even um, he even organised Joe Mercer to come and give me a, a lesson on the mechanical horse they had in the called Knock Knock in the in the okay. in the colour room. And I used to be on that every afternoon, practicing. Um, and you know, to 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 have someone like Joe Mercer, you know, give you give you his his opinions and his his advice. That's 
that's a, that's a real privilege that not many people have, have had. And then you went racing. So how was that? Can you remember, what are the things that stand out? Is it your first race? Is it the first time you noticed something? Is it the yeah. paddock? What was it, what was it that kind of stands out to you when well, you was, look back? I, I was very sm I was tiny. I think I was, when I had my first ride, I was six stone 10, something like that. So it, I was really light, really small, you know, very immature um, physically. <laughs> And uh, your wife's and, off camera there, yeah. and she's going to say something else. But we'll. <laughs> but and, and anyway, so they decided I was I was ready to have my first ride on Tiny Tim, the Hogmane Polar Pony, and they decided that the best place to give me my first ride was a Brighton, probably the most challenging track in this country, or at least one of them. Anyway, um, Tiny Tim just did what he did. He he just he he. he Safeguarded me around there and I just sat on top of him. Didn't have a clue what was going on. Pulled up, thought, oh, I loved it. Finished second, I think. I think second or third. And I don't remember anything about the race. Um, I think there was a few jockeys drawn near me and they looked very worried in the stores. You know, see this little boy on this horse at Brighton. He's probably not going to be in control. This, you know, so they look quite worried. I do remember that bit. Um, but I remember pulling up, I just thought, I, I, this is, I love it. That I just want to do it again immediately. Wanted to do it again straight away, um, and you know, the horse ran well as well. So he, he gave me a bit of a buzz. Um, and then, do you remember your first winner? And do you remember I, the buzz from that? Well, I got I had a, I had a ride shortly afterwards at Nottingham. Claire Balding on this horse, and that was my first real experience of a mess up. And it was a, I mean, I know it was early in my career, but it was a. Dropped my reins. I mean, it was the worst ride you could ever imagine. And uh, and I got it. You know, I, I got the the bollockings and you know what I did wrong and stuff like that from so many different people, <laughs> but that included. So so I got that out of the way. You know, cleared the decks, had a couple of rides, and I rode my first winner on at Salisbury. Um, and then it's funny how you when I asked you. Um, can you remember your first winner? You remember your first bollocking before you remember yeah, your first yeah, winner. Yeah. Like, is that does that stand out more in your head? And yeah. you, I guess you learn from that. Yeah, you do. And it was, it was. Um, I think I even got a bollocking from other jockeys. It was, it was like it was. Yeah, it was. It was a. It really stood out, you know. And, and it was a. Listen, there's been many mistakes since, but <laughs> that was the first one, and um, that was an, an, another experience. So you painted a very like impressive picture of your young young jockey ship, jockey ship. So you went to John Gosden after that. Yeah, that's you know fast forward a few years, I suppose. Um, and uh, you know I'd already had, you know I was fortunate in in the sense that Andrew had enough belief in me that when I did lose my claim, um, he still kept using me. And I think it, shortly afterwards I was kind of this, this, the the main the main stable jockey. Um, and uh, you know that's a challenging time for a jockey when you do lose your claim. So he, that he, faith is so important at that stage, huge, right? Huge, yeah, huge. And you, you know, you have to, you have to repay them. You know, you have to produce the goods. And uh, um, but that was, uh, you know, that was very important for me. A very important stage of a, of, of a jockey's career. Um, and then uh, I was, I, I got a winter job in Dubai with Druba Selvaratnam. That. Um, the boarding family had sort of organised as well. So, um, and then I was actually in Dubai when, when, uh, when John phoned me, and uh, you know I, I couldn't, I couldn't quite believe it really. You know, it was so early in my career, and um, I'd had my first Group One winner in Canada that, um, that same year. Had you ridden for John before him calling ne you? Never. Did his number come up in your phone? Did you have his no, number? No, 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 I didn't have his number. So it's just, who's this? Do you think it's someone's pranking you yeah. or something? No, well, <laughs> you know, and he, he actually didn't, um, he didn't really tell me, uh, he just said he wanted to have a chat and um, he didn't really tell me um, what it was about, you know, but I sort of, I couldn't tell anyone. Um, I, I did tell my dad um, and sort of, Ended up having having a chat with John, and and uh, you know it was it was an, an amazing opportunity to to become you know John's stable jockey at Clarehaven. It was a a massive step for me, and uh, it was a a complete game changer. Um, you know the 
uh, moved to Newmarket, you know, um, some of the best horses around, biggest owners, um, big move. And I suppose, uh, again, I was relatively young and, and relatively na naive. So I was going to say, were you naive, confident? I, no, or... I think I was. I, I think I think I was naive. I think I was, yeah, um, because I didn't really see the how big it, how big it was and, and how much faith John and the owners had put in me. Um, so I think I was a bit naive. Um, Maybe that worked in the positive, I don't know, did I it? I think it did, because obviously when, when Dara Mir went out for the Shima Classic, that was, I think it was one of my first rides for John. Um, and at the time it was obviously a huge race and I hadn't ridden in those races many times. N never ridden in that race before. Um, only really had a handful of rides in Group 1 races. Um, and here I am riding one of the favourites for a $5 million race. Um, and it was, I was excited, but I, 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 was, I was definitely a bit naive. Um, Ignorance of youth, maybe a little but bit. Poss possibly, yeah. Anyway, she won and, you know, it was just a perfect way to start the, the relationship. And uh, I'm, I'm sure at the time John was, was quite relieved as well. Did you think, well, maybe he knew you were kind of you're naive and you'd be free and just go for it, man? Who knows? Yeah, I mean, you need things to go right. Any, any young jockey in a big job like that, you know, you need things to go right. And when you do get a good start, it, it does make things all the easier. Um, and um, look, John, John is, is obviously, you know, he, he, for, for a young jockey like I was, a great mentor. Um, you know they took me in as uh, as their as their own John and Rachel and uh, you know I'll I'll um I'll always be indebted to them. I've spoken to other like jockeys that have done well and other sports people and they kind of talk about you need your first slice of luck or the right people speaking to you at the right time yeah. kind of those sliding doors moment. Yeah. Would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, exactly that. And and I suppose like uh, you know every day I had with John you try and pick up something, um, you know, or try and learn something, um, you, you know, and uh, obviously he's got a, he's got such a great way of, of, of explaining those things. And uh, I suppose he, he sort of, they, you, you tap into your potential, I suppose. And fast forwarding on again, Godolphin. Yeah. So how does that come about? Yeah, again, um, obviously I'd had five, five years with John and, you know, five great years. And, and, I, and I feel as a, as a jockey, it, it definitely brought me on. And um, obviously it was to 2015 where, where I um, went to Godolphin and I mean, I'd, I'd uh, I'd obviously ridden, you know, for the operation a, a fair bit, obviously through John as well, um, you know, having, having horses um, for them. So I was sort of aware of the, um, the workings of the, of the operation. And, and Charlie, uh, I, he, I think he'd been training for two years before I came there. And, you know, I'd ridden a lot for Charlie as well and sort of got to know Charlie pretty well. And, wrote a bit of work for him um, before I before I officially went. And I want to talk to you about 2018 and the derby. Like, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but for pretty much any flat jockey you speak to, yeah. that's the one. That's the one, absolutely. Um, and I'd had enough goals in the derby without winning it. So I knew how hard it was. Um, you know, it's like everything needs to go right. The preparation, you know, the day, the race, you, you cannot have any slip ups. You can't have any, any mistakes. Um, and uh, obviously, um, uh, Godolphin had never won the derby. So, you know, to, to go if in, into the derby with Massa was, uh, you know, he was stepping up from, I think he, he was stepping up from a mile to a mile and a half. So we were obviously, you know, we thought of getting a mile and a quarter, mile and a half, you, you, you don't know. Um, but, you know, Charlie had him in great shape on the day and 
he, he won. He won pretty easy. And uh, you just... Can you remember that moment where you thought, you know, you've got it? Yeah. Exactly. And because, you know, I'd had enough, I'd had enough rides in the race to understand, to have a, have a pretty good understanding of the race. Um, and to sort of, when I did realise I'd won. When was this? How to, far out? Well, <laughs> I probably actually hit the front a little bit too soon. But I thought when I did hit the front, I hit win. Um, because he, he had, he travelled around a beautifully, very well balanced horse. Um, and when I pushed the button, it was, it was just a case of, you know, just, I remember thinking, don't do anything silly, just, just keep him balanced and, and get home in front. Um, and if, you, if you've, if you've got time to think about stuff like that, that's usually a good time. Yeah. And lots of sports people say it didn't sink in or it sunk in at some stage later. Can you remember what it was like? You'd won the derby, the crowd are going wild. Yeah. Was it a haze? What was what was the? It was just I was. If, it was just brilliant, you know. It was just a, something that I'd never experienced on a racetrack before, um, and it was a point in my career where you know I I, I appreciated it. You know, it wasn't. You know, you sometime, weren't that naive youngster anymore. No, you exactly. kind of no, got it a little bit. I knew how hard it was, um, and and to see to see. Um, to see his highness, what it meant to him when I came in, um, and and, and uh, you know everybody else within the operation, Charlie, uh, it, it was it, it's it's amazing. It, it's a race that you know it, it does that to people. It's 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 our most important race. And the evening, and what was it like seeing the family and stuff? And what yeah. was the after party or after after well, math like? Yeah, I mean it was just. Uh, there wasn't much celebration because it was you had the Prix de Jockey Club the next day um, in Chantilly. So, um, so life of a jockey, right? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> not but like no, a Ryder Cup. <laughs> yeah, but I just remember like the journey home. It was like, you know, it, you just you just feel great. Euphoria, it's, kind of. Yeah, it is. It is, and I think everyone who's who's won the Derby would, would say the same. You know, it's it's a it's a very special race. From the corner on the cob through the window to the win in the derby yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, um, had all the had all the ingredients. <laughs> it's the natural path, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and then, and I guess now to the kind of the present present day, mm. two time champion jockey. I mean, as an accomplishment, it's different to winning the derby one race. It takes a whole season and a yeah. lot of work going into it. How yeah. how big is it to you? And it's not easy to defend. Um, no. Um, I did go out this season to defend it. You know that was my um, my goal, uh, and I I always say, um, you know, my main job is as retained rider to go dolphin. So everything else, you know, is an is an added bonus after that. Um, and obviously, you know, the champion jockey is is a it's it's a it's a sort of a, a selfish um, accomplishment, you know. But at the same time. Um, you know, it's it, it's sort of. I'm still able to do it. You know, I'm I'm sort of at the right age still. Um, and this year we, we went out to defend it, and um, I think, you know, obviously Tony Hind is he he has had a a, a big influence on, on on my career these last four years, five years maybe. Um, and um, you know, I must say his sort of determination and work ethic uh, is is something that you know I don't think you see very often. Um, he's a he, he's a big driving force, um, you know, be, and, behind and it. And work ethic's got to be the number one thing to be a champion jockey, yeah. hasn't it? You're you're uh, around a lot. Yeah. It's hard to get you sat down here today because yeah. you were meant to be going to Newcastle, yeah. and then yeah. so it's just so important, right? It is, it is, and you know the long days, and I mean, I've, I've, I, I think it's like a, it's not just me doing it. It's it's a whole team of people. Obviously, Jane, you know, she's at home with the two boys. So, you know, the, the long days for her as well. Um, 
It kind of leads me on, actually. I was going to say, how good was it kind of celebrate that moment where you were champion jockey last yeah. year? You could share it with Thomas and Oscar, I think, was not just very born, old. Born, yeah. Yeah. How cool was it to kind of share that moment with, with him? Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I, I don't really know what they sort of, well, what Thomas, what, what, he, what, his, what his understanding was of it last year, but I think he enjoyed himself on the stage. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, he's, I, I suppose it's, um, it's nice one day to show them, um, you know, that, that, you know, they were there. Um, and also, you know, moments like that, they, you know, when you, when you achievements like that, they're for sharing, you know, because like I said, it's a, it's a big team behind it all. And, and, and you know, agents, family, owners, trainers, you know, um, you, everything needs to fall into place and click um, because it's, you can't have, um, you can't have, you've got to have everything. You can't have one thing missing. And everyone in that group has made sacrifices for you to be there, would you say? Yeah, for sure. The case? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, um, obviously, um, you know, none more so than, than Jane, I would say. You know, she sees it every day. Um, and, you know, they, they are long days, but at the same time, it, it's the job. It's the industry that we live in, and she understands it as well as I do so that's a that's very important to, to have that as well because um, you know yes there are great days there have been great days but you know you, you most of the time you, if, if you go through a season with a 20 or 25% strike rate say 20% strike rate that's 80% you, you get beat 80% of the time so there are a lot of days where but it don't work out and, and when you when you go for a championship a lot of the days are just graft you know it's just a, the bread and butter of it um but i've learned as well that you know those days are as important um you know when, when you when you win on a horse that you possibly made a difference on you know no matter what race it is but you you might have made a difference to that horse um you know that's also a, that's also something that that can give you pretty good satisfaction and it must uh, put, put words in your mouth again here but it must fill you with kind of confidence that you're doing the right thing when you're doing all this graft that you've got a family behind yeah. you that are yeah. giving you that confidence that they they're, they're they're behind you in making these choices yeah i mean that's what it's all about right you know it's um you know i was always when when I was younger, you know, we, we always had a tight knit family and, uh, and always had a, you know, a, a, a great upbringing. And, you know, we, we are the same with, with our kids and, you know, mum and dad are still, still, still here and my brothers and, and everyone else. So, um, you know, it's, it's just great to have, to have them here and, you know, and supporting. And your mum's here literally today. She's here. She, she got, came in this morning. Yeah, so it's great to have. She's here for Oscar's birthday tomorrow. Yeah. So and um, I like I like this. Uh, whenever I'm with families that are dual language, you're flitting between oh, yeah. Norwegian and English, yeah. right? Yeah. Does Jane understand what you're saying? She, I, I, it's unbelievable, really. She's <laughs> she's been must be over ten years now, and she can't speak a word. So if you want to talk about her, it's in Norwegian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And kind of the f the future. Finally, what's the future? Is it three, four, five time champion jockey? Is it what? What? What do you want to achieve out of the sport? Still, is it what is the what's what's keeping that burning kind of desire? Well, I mean, you, you know, I, I don't. You can't really make a plan like that, you know. But certainly, you know, keep going um, as best as I can, obviously, and and trying to keep improving yourself because I think in this sport you know things evolve quickly um, you know younger jockeys come come along they pick up things you know so I think you always have to you always have to look to to improve yourself and there's always room for improvement you know whether that's in your skill set or whether that's in your mentality your mental approach to it um, you know there's always there's always ways to improve and, and that's something that I, I will hopefully continue to to do and I need to do um you're gonna go on as long as Frankie <laughs> I wouldn't mind having the same same farewell tour like he had <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, he's, uh, I mean, Frankie, was he 52, 53? Uh, it's amazing, really. And, and to be at the level that he's at, you know, he's, he's a... You know what goes into it to do that, to be at that level. Yeah, but you see, like, like you know, you know, Frankie would never miss a day's training. You know, he's healthy, he's fit, um, and look at the longevity he's had um, at the very highest level. That's a hard thing to do to stay at that level um, for, for that amount of time. I, that that is an incredible sacrifice, um, and that's something you know that would probably be my ambition is to is to to try and stay at the top level of, of the sport. And finally, is there one race, if you could win one more race, or if you could win, have one more accolade, what, you, what, what would that be? There the are plenty of races that I haven't won. There are, there are quite, there's the many. Greedy the many, jockey, the there's many. not just one, is no, it? there are many races, so I mean, but if I had to pick one, it would be the Arc de Triomphe. Um, you know, you know I've, I've never really come close to winning it. Um, but you know, as a as a spectacle, as a race, it's just a, you know, obviously it's phenomenal. It's a that's that's one that's missing. Nice one, William. Well, thanks so much for the chat. It was really enjoyable. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.